money and banking didn't matter in the final analysis, couldn't explain a single thing to me. So I sought intellectual refuge elsewhere. Most crucially, I started taking cross-listed courses at um, Harvard Law School, where some level of heterodoxy was surprisingly allowed. And so ultimately for me, it wasn't an economist, but it was one of the founders of the critical legal studies movement, uh, Roberto Mangabera Unger, who introduced me to post-Keynesian institutionalists and Marxian economics. He adamantly encouraged me and um, well, all of us in the class to read two thinkers in particular. The first was Hyman Minsky, and the second was the man moderating this panel right here, Mr. Bill Black. Um, so it's, this is a bit of a surreal experience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but from that experience, um, which was inherently interdisciplinary, uh, I developed a deep interest in financial reform and more broadly in understanding the rules of the economy. Um, I spent two years after graduation working for um, then Attorney General, now Senator Kamala Harris, during the multi-state mortgage fraud settlement. And after that, I went to law school with a plan to figure out maybe how we get out of this mess. Um, I made it a point to take every finance course I could. I entered in federal regulatory agencies. And I tried to meet everyone, you know, even touching on any kind of this subject matter. But most importantly, I met Rob Gray, Lily Vo, Marie Schweinberger, Jean Gokmark, a bunch of other like-minded classmates, and other folks who were here, uh, Rebecca Roche, Tim Fong, Ethan Tankis, leaving out a lot of people. But they introduced me to all of this, to MMT. And for me, MMT was a missing piece of the puzzle at the end. Well, actually, that's not quite giving it enough credit. MMT tied everything together and it's kind of a unique view on the monetary system highlighted how a lot of the dots connect from there. So there we were, um, you know, a group, I'd say seven or eight of us, at Columbia First and other universities later, and we wanted to find out what the law had to say about modern money, and even just money or macroeconomics really at all. And the answer was to say the least deflating for us. And we found out that this was intentional. A lot of people in the legal academy want it this way. Um, to illustrate the point that I'm making, I'm going to share a quote with you that you may have heard, um, because we just can't share it enough times. But this is uh, from recently retired uh, Judge Dick Posner. Um, this is from <laughs> September 23rd, 2009. Until last September, when the banking industry came crashing down and depression loomed for the first time in my lifetime, I had never thought to read the general theory of employment interest in money. It was a work of macroeconomics, the study of economy-wide phenomena. Law, and hence the economics of law, did not figure largely into the regulation of those phenomena. Having now read the general theory, I have concluded that it is the best guide that we have to the crisis. So this is, this is Richard Posner. This is the most cited legal scholar of the 20th century, a leader of a movement that calls itself law and economics. He preached and mandated from the bench nonsense for decades without even bothering to read something that's essential for a lawyer to do, which is read the opposing counsel's complaint. <laughs> in our second year, Robert Jackson, who was just nominated to be an SEC commissioner, noted during one of our seminars that the way we talk about money systems in law school has been blocked in a way because we're not honest with each other about the fact that our money system is a legal choice, and while we cover microeconomics in reasonable depth for obvious reasons, we barely touch macroeconomics at all. It was little acknowledgments like that that kept us growing as we you know, tried to move and tried to find more people and nurture something like, you know, an auxiliary arm of, a, of this paradigm. It was incredibly difficult. Uh, broader discussion of political economy rarely gets into law school curricula at all. When it does, it's usually descriptive. Few courses question normative assumptions. Um, the few that do are worth their weight in gold by far. As far as money itself goes, um, in my time, we mostly had to do that on our, own, on our own with a few notable exceptions, like if you could, um, managed to get into uh, Christine Dazon's The Constitutional Law of Money at Harvard, or if you could see a video about that, like that was, that was, that was, you were jonesing for that, but that was, you know, virtually all that was available. <laughs> um, Columbia Law School in particular was not the most welcoming of institutions for our effort. Within the legal world, Columbia is still stereotypically known for turning out white shoot lawyers to serve Wall Street. So there's plenty of law and finance going on at Columbia. It's just not always the kind that we kind of want to see. Um, at the same time, we were incredibly fortunate to have a few professors interested in cultivating our blasphemy, and namely that was Katarina Pistor, Kate Judge, and uh, the late Tamara Lothian, who's very much missed. Um, with their help and a lot of you know kind of banging our heads against the wall, 
we managed to put on eventually more than 60 symposia at that school, all interdisciplinary, bringing economists and lawyers together. We ran a weekly screed in the new in the school newspaper. Uh, we hosted a few conferences, and we even managed to corner a few orthodox thinkers and press them on their on their premises, which is what lawyers should be doing. The most notable example of that was probably the Rethinking Economics Conference of 2014, when Rowan got Krugman on the record defending local funds theory. Most saliently, though, uh, we managed to build a network of, of friends and, and colleagues uh, to support each other. And so from our initial beginnings as a small student group at Columbia Law School, uh, we managed to incorporate as a nonprofit and then turn into an international organization with affiliates and supporters in Europe, Australia, and Latin America now. In recent years, the lawyers are starting to show up. And that's due in no small part to the incredible support that we've received, I think, from the MMT elders, from the economics folks. Um, but we've also had a lot of people just come to us who have arrived at a lot of MMT conclusions on their own. And you know, here we are with open arms and just elated. But we're, we're excited about all this, um, if only for the reason that one of the, one, of the, one of the major reasons the Modern Money Network exists is so that people don't have to find progressive or radical law in economics in the way that we had to do it. The kind of research we engage in should be free and readily available to everyone. That's part of why we you know, try to maintain a free website. Uh, whatever university you're at, you should be able to get into this stuff. Or maybe even especially if you're not at a university. It should be there if you're a grad student. It should be there if you're just someone who wants to understand the world around. Uh, we're at a point now where we have a tremendous amount of work ahead of us, but we've also never been stronger. We really are building a network and you know, connecting people to specific professors and other students who can be on the team. Um, and again, this hasn't really been available, I don't think, in the way that it is now. There are all kinds of great organizations that have pushed progressive law and economic policies, but to try to actually you know, build a paradigm is, I think, something a little bit special. And you know, identifying particular people who are interested in that is worth its weight in gold. I would have killed to have Bob uh, Hockett, who's gonna join us from the computer, you know, teach me business associations, to have Martha teach me con law, to have Bill teach me anything, <laughs> to have um, someone like Lua Kamal Yule, who's in Kansas, teach me property law. She unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, we had to build all this, and we hope to not do that in the future, uh, or excuse me, we don't wanna have other people have to build it. We wanna have it ready there for them. We have the capacity and the potential now to become a full-fledged, chapter-based intellectual edifice. Um, you know, through people's generosity. Um, so there's some, you know, donation papers going around. Um, you know, but welcome both time funds anything you can support because our opponents are very strong. The conservatives have intellectual infrastructure. They have organizations like the Federalist Society that promote their own scholars, professors, judges, practitioners, and try to hegeia hegemony, achieve hegemony within the legal world. All right, so that's what MMN does. That's great, um, but why should you really care? Why should anyone really? Lawyers are annoying. Um, you know, you guys can just come in and look at the paperwork once we have the ideas and it's all set. The first reason should be obvious. Everybody hates lawyers until they need them, and our opponents happen to have a lot of lawyers, so you'll want us especially bad when the time comes. But really, I, I want to highlight two specific uh, roles for lawyers with the time that I have left. And that's one, I think that legal history is especially important for fleshing out MMT narratives and winning some tough battles in the public conversation. And two, I think that lawyers and economists have to be partners in policy design, not to mention that we should be joining all kinds of other social scientists and thinkers and activists, etc. But if you'll forgive me for being a little frank, I think there's a tendency among economists to think that lawyers just come in on the back end and figure out the details of economic policy. Like, you you implement this. But we do do that, but that's not all that we do, because that's not all that law does with respect to the economy. As I said at a panel this morning, law is not merely a governing force, as many on the right would have economists believe, nor is it merely a reflective force in the sense that it just is a manifestation of you know, deeper political currents. It is also a constitutive, constructive force. And what I mean by that is that the law doesn't just intervene in the economy. Um, rather, a lot of the economic concepts that we talk about only have a particular meaning in the context of specific legal parameters. And they only exist given the deeper architecture of legal regimes in the sense of systems design. To explain what I mean by that, I'm going to try to briefly illustrate um, those points by talking about the job guarantee. 
Um, Dr. Cherneva and I are currently working on an interdisciplinary chapter on unemployment for a uh, casebook, a legal textbook called Law and Economics Contemporary Approaches, which is being organized by a group Martha um, leads called Appeal, the Association for Promotion of Political Economy and Law. I'm also doing similar research with another outfit called Class Crits, which um, Martha and Angela Harris help head. Um, they are about to launch a new journal called Journal of Law and Political Economy. Everyone should check that out. But anyway, throughout all this research, some things about the law have been cast in, into relief for me, especially with how law interacts with macroeconomics. So first, I think the legal side of M&T can predictably help flesh out why exactly we need a job guarantee and where its roots in American society lie. We can help tell the story in a fuller way um, that, you know, I, I think m and economists tell the story incredibly well, but it can only be, you know, supplemented and complemented by bringing in more disciplines. It's, it's one thing to say we deserve a right to dignified work, it's another thing to substantiate that claim in the public eye and destroy the counterclaims that will be mounted by the other side, not only by Chicago school lawyers, but by moderate concern trolls who tell us, well, I don't see a job guarantee in the Constitution. I don't imagine how that could be a right. As I was alluding to earlier, orthodox economists and their legal colleagues often fail to account for the state's design of social systems in the first place. So when it comes to the labor system, specifically, uh, most of the lawyers are borrowing from neoclassical economists. Most are suggesting that some level of unemployment is natural that unemployment is a tendency of labor markets anterior and separate to the state. From this perspective, workers seek to freely match with employers and concretize their matching via labor contracts. And although the state may regulate the quality of these contracts, regulation tends to reduce the total quantity of contracts and thus unemployment, as well as infringing upon freedom, so we can't have a job guarantee because you're gonna mess up and you're gonna get sand in the gears. Obviously, heterodox economists have argued, against the position, uh, have argued against this vision for decades. I'm not going to rehash the economists' arguments here, but um, suffice it to say, to, you know, from what I've learned from Pavlina and others, is that um, because labor is fundamentally distinct from other commodities, there is no market for labor in the aggregate. But even if one existed from a lawyer's perspective, the concept of intervention in the labor market would still be incoherent. Because the state creates and administers the background rules of the labor system, which coerce people to work, the laws of the state constitute, rather than merely govern, the labor system, rendering the idea of intervention pretty much nonsensical. The United States government, of course, did not invent employment and unemployment. Rather, it inherited the legal architecture, as Blackstone would say, from the British Empire. Throughout the 18th century, Parliament stripped peasants of their rights to land, compelling them to work for landowners to survive. I think we all know the enclosure story. But as legal realists like Robert Lee Hale argued, this process of le legal coercion continued affirmatively in the United States. Over time, the US government spread the wage labor system, enclosing the lands of indigenous peoples, allowing women to form wage work for men, exploiting poor migrant workers, and perhaps most monumentally, turning slaves into freedmen without land or their capital. As governments legally eliminated the material preconditions for self-sufficiency, they birthed the modern concepts of unemployment, and employment. So again, just two minutes, okay. Uh, I'm gonna go through a little bit more quickly. Um, so there, the, le the legal history in the United States supports the notion that there is a legal wrong. Koleski and, you know, among other folks, argued that the coercion of work and the creation of a reserve army of the unemployed is a feature of the system necessary to maintain a monetary production economy. I think you can see that in the legal history of the United States. Um, I'll get into the court stuff a little bit, maybe in Q&A, someone asked me about that. But, um, so, that's, that's, I think legal history can help flesh out the narrative here. My second point about what I think lawyers can do for MMT is help in policy, in, help in policy design specifically. Again, lawyers aren't just here for details, I think we can provide insights that should inform the discussion about programmatic trajectory, so to speak. Um, for example, I think that the legal history and the recent direction of doctrine um, suggests that maybe we should not cast a job guarantee primarily as a transitional program or even as an automatic stabilizer. I think those two things are very important. But strategically, we have to lead with the moral high ground because of the way this works out in the courts. I understand that we all have moral and political differences of opinion with respect to how permanent a job guarantee might be. 
but I'm afraid if that we don't say we deserve a JG job as a matter of universal inalienable right for as long as we want it, wherever in life we happen to be, the legislature, the courts, and captured administrative agencies are going to shred the program. Um, I think that the history of unemployment insurance is particularly helpful and illustrative in this respect. Um, when we started, the, the, the unemployment insurance uh, movement, you know, started by casting things as a right. You know, you deserve unemployment insurance. But it, a lot of what happened when it got to Congress was that folks wanted to highlight the business-friendly, you know, qualities here. And what this did was it left spaces open for courts to pull in cracks and say, well, you know, if really the chief aim of unemployment insurance was macroeconomic stabilization, look how the economy has changed. We don't really need that anymore. Or if it's a transitional program, you can pick at the eligibility requirements. And over time, a lot of social programs that focus on technical aspects and how they serve a certain purpose within the macro economy don't tend to survive. So I think that's one example of where lawyers should be talking to economists and vice versa and should be talking about, you know, maybe what is the best messaging, not only so that we can build an elegant program, but the, so that we can build policy programs that survive the test of time. Um, so that's my own analysis with respect to program design, but the point is that lawyers should be involved in it. And, you know, MMT economists, I think we can all agree, have laid out the code of the economy in a way that I think has never been done before. But if we're going to make claims with respect to that code, uh, we need to work together. Call us. Um, I promise we'll pick up the phone this time. Hi, I'm Martha McCluskey. I teach at SUNY Buffalo Law School and um, don't have any real economics background, but um, I am the... No need to brag. <laughs> <laughs> But um, it, it, I, I came to law school inspired by feminist critical legal theory and then uh, got interested in critical race theory, critical legal studies from there. And um, I was particularly, this was the 1980s, and there was a, a big backlash that, um, that kind of particularly focused on, oh, those movements are simply about storytelling and narrative. We do rigorous stuff, and especially the counterpoint to that was the rigorous scientific approach to law that real academics do is law and economics. And, but my, my uh, group of, of uh, <laughs> supportive dissident colleagues would sit in the back of our corporations class, our tax class, the other classes where the dominant or the only view was, was the kind of standard law and economics analysis, we'd say, this has all the metaphors, the images, the, the methods. It's, it's really a fairy telling genre. And one of the best law and economics articles ever written is Arthur Blatch's article in 1970, I think it was three? It was a review of um, Post, Judge Posner's uh, initial textbook on law and economics that kind of launched the movement onto the mainstream. And, and he said, this is, this is like Don Quixote. It's a romantic novel. And it, it's, <laughs> you know, it has a, a lovely, fanciful answer to everything. And it, its logic depends on what well, he called it, it's, it's nominalism. So it's a, so it's realism about nominalism. It's just a tautology. And, and, then, and, and it kind of answers the blooming, buzzing confusion that otherwise would be law by telling a nice story. So <laughs> that's sort of, I've picked up on that. And, and, um, and, it, and it, it, I just had so many experiences of, of like asking people, do you really believe this? Like, does it make sense? <laughs> and, and various forms of answers were kind of like, well, maybe not, but this is what everyone's talking about, and, and I'll get tenure and, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, so, um, and, and, and so it became clear to me that there needed to be another conversation and that that law and economic success wasn't about you know a marketplace of the ideas and the best ideas rising to the top, um, but it was about um, the success of uh, of the right wing in creating a very very intentionally and, and, and lavishly investing in in their words a um, a community a movement that would exert social emotional uh, community pressure basically on on changing. Um, the way legal education is taught. And specifically, it was designed to undermine 
the uh, more lefty liberal trends in legal education in the 1960s and 1970s that were really in the foreground of, of, of civil rights and the Great Society, legal services, um, uh, uh, rights for welfare recipients, um, regulatory state provisions, all of that. And, and um, you probably know some of the stories about the think tanks and stuff organizing, but law and economics was a particular part in that. So just, uh, <coughs> Okay, yeah. So one, one of the groups I've, I've formed that I really encourage you to um, check out, just um, developing our website, but this is the um, Association for Promotion of Political Economy and Law, politicaleconomylaw.org. And, um, and we've held a series of events over maybe three or four years, and um, that's how I got connected to uh, Raul and Rohan and then the larger MMT community. And But we've always been trying to bring in the um, uh, other views of economics that just aren't even on the table in law. Like, there's, even last week I gave a presentation at my relatively progressive law school and my colleagues couldn't imagine any other way of thinking about economics. I mean, it was just literally impossible for them to get their heads around. So we need to build this community and, and I'm really glad to be networking with this, this wonderful group and to um, take advantage of your um, insights and, and your provocations. Um, so I guess one of the things that I'm, this conference is occasioning for me is the opportunity to think, well, what does MMT mean? I don't really do uh, monetary policy per se, and I'm sort of more of a generalist, but I, it seems to me that MMT really shakes the foundations of law and economics, and, and I'm not exactly sure how that is, but I'm using this as an occasion to do some exploration of that. So um, uh, let me just put this up. Um, Law and economics, uh, I, you know, I think it might not be an exaggeration to, to really call it a really organized sort of fake economics, just like the fake news of today's yeah. um, uh, attention in the news. Uh, it, it, is, um, it is, above all, to think of it as a, an organized political movement. I think that it's, I, I haven't seen anyone really calculate the figures, but as of about 15 or 20 years ago, the Olin Foundation had invested at least 50 million into it. That foundation sort of ended its run, but I, I'm sure it's not an exaggeration to say uh, well over $100 million tar has been um, targeted, particularly the um, more elite uh, law schools in the United States, so that um, the, basically the, 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 the centers of legal education and legal scholarship um, are dominated by uh, very lavishly funded law and economics programs of various kinds. And even beyond that, it's, it's shaped the, the kind of ground of, of even people who don't identify with law and economics. One of the ways they've done that is uh, through law and economics seminars uh, for training various uh, uh, experts in law that this is outside of the legal education process in addition to their funding of, of law school change. They've, um, George Mason is the one that, uh, location of the current uh, version of this. Um, and just to give some um, examples of that, they, they claim that, and I think it's, it's probably accurate, that they have trained 5,000 US judges, 750 law professors, and this is a few years out of date, so I'm sure it's more like that. To, uh, more today. In one year, one recent year, I was on their website, um, they said they, in just that year, they had 35 seminars covering 84 days, participants, 48 states, 35 nations, 149 academic institutions, 20 commissioned papers. <laughs> I'm sure not disclosing the funding terms. And <laughs> um, anyway, so it, it really has become the norm, and they're, um, you know, they, they continue to say on their website, we present a balanced and neutral view of economics, and we just provide tools. <laughs> um, and of course, the funding is notable, especially increasingly at, at George Mason, the Coke industry and various charities um, are at, at the core of that, as well as most of the major interests. Um, you know. So it's not, so the idea that it is somehow enlightening us in, in the public interest is preposterous, I think. Um, anyway, so the appeal, though, goes beyond the pure um, uh, bribing and monetary value, I think, of this. And, and part of the appeal is that um, 
as Arthur Lev said in that early article on, on the, the narrative strategy of law and economics, it, it, it answers a void in a crisis of faith and legitimacy in law and government. So um, back in the early 20th century, the what's called the legal realism movement, which included a lot of progressive law and economics um, scholars, really uh, great people whose continued work continues to be really important. Um, so this uh, progressive legal realism movement challenged what had been the 19th century view that law was a scientific sort of logical process of deducting from uh, central principles that could be done in a purely formal way without engaging with the legal rule world, I mean the real world in, in any kind of detail. So um, the progressive uh, era of, of US government policy was in part fueled by the legal realism and then the New Deal of the um, 20th century was really grounded in a lot of scholars and advocacy groups and, and legal experts who believed and, and implemented the program that um, democratic policy can run the economy and should run the economy and that uh, expertise in uh, interdisciplinary expertise in empirical studies of society and how things really work on the ground is essential to formulating that democratic policy. Now that that era established sort of uh, developed into a kind of legal process sphere of uh, mainstream legal theory for most of the 20th century, well, till the, till the last quarter of the 20th century. And then um, and the organized law and economics movement in particular, but others uh, really focused on, I think, what were legitimate problems in that vision. It didn't sufficiently account for the failure of so-called neutral political processes, uh, it didn't really balance the public interest and in the political system is, um, allows much more complicated and arbitrary power and, and is not democratic as the New Deal you know, ideal might have suggested. And similarly, scientific expertise, social sciences, uh, include plenty of opportunity for experts to be captured by industry, to be full of their own biases and misconceptions, regulatory agencies were captured, um, and that the legal goals of things like uh, civil rights um, were confronted a lot of challenges implementing them on the ground and just a, a real legitimate disagreements about the best strategies but also um, sort of co-optation and, um, and uh, the formal principles of equality were insufficient. So the, the problem really is summed up by the critical legal studies movement that said that law is really power and how do we grapple then? What's the legitimacy of, of legal expertise of judges, of lawmakers? How can we have legitimate government if it's power and not in any neat and simple way distinct from political power or, or force? It is violence. <laughs> and so um, as critical legal studies tried in, in the various branches of that feminism, critical race theory, tried to um, say, well, yes, and we have to engage in that power and, and, and take sides in the, in the real problems here and say we have political wrongs um, these are the political values we want to advance, democracy, inclusion, equity, other things like that. Um, but that, that sets up a context. It's not a neutral, objective process that we can stand back from as disinterested uh, experts. And, um, uh, but that, that didn't go over well in a lot of, my <laughs> in a lot of circles of power. And, um, and so law and economics came in with a different answer. And their answer was that okay, we, we can solve all this, we can come up with an objective, neutral, disinterested answer so we don't have to grapple and take sides on these hard debates. And uh, although, in fact, we can take a lot of money from a certain side in the debate and um, that will be a, a neutral answer. And, and I may be exaggerating a little bit, but I think the answer ultimately that they give is, is something along the lines that it's, we, can, we can deal with the problem that law is power, by saying, instead, money is law. So I think underlying their vision is really the idea that money is the reality, law is the epiphenomenon. So all of law only works um, if it 
becomes a, a, a game, a, a goal of, of matching whatever this real underlying monetary uh, reality is, which they don't question, it's just as natural, it's there. And further all, furthermore, at the foundation of this is the idea that money is not power. So that's what's distinct about using money as the measure for law. Unlike law, which is suspect, arbitrary, potentially biased, captured power, <coughs> money is just real. It's, no, it's money is merit. Money is merit. Well, merit. that's it's yeah, based that's on perfect. It's the outcome of perfect process, perfect freedom, and perfect information. But the but the nice thing about it is that even though money is not power, it is actually pure force. It has the force of power. It, in other words, it's the only legitimate form of, of authority. Money is strong. Law is weak because people obey money. People don't obey law. And that's the, the law and society movement, the legal realism movement, uh, critical legal studies um, developed that principle. In other words, you have a law in the book. That doesn't mean it's going to play out that way in practice because law has to grapple with the, the other forms of power and resistance <coughs> to the law. Um, so that, again, creates complications for people who want to claim you know, democratic legal authority and expertise. So, so the answer to that is, well, OK, we get rid of, we really make law subordinate to money, and people will obey money because economics, in this view, reveals principles of behavior in response to price. Law is just another form of price. These principles of behavior are essentially universal, natural, and all we have to do is reveal them, and we'll understand how people will act. Law can mimic that, can be the epiphenomenon that can you know, smooth that over, but law can't really change that, because people won't obey law. They'll obey money, and the same thing will happen. So anything you try to do that's good for people with law that counters the effect of money will be uh, will be doomed to fail. And, and uh, as part of this sort of law and economics re-education uh, empire, Joshua Wright, I think, is, is one of the people um, who quoted on one of their um, sort of ex introductions that law and economics is a neutral tool for studying the forces that govern law and society like gravity. So it, they explicitly use this idea of a natural force to explain what they're doing and to say it's, it's simply natural and normal. So I'm going to uh, just mention a few other sort of wrong ideas that I think the MMT insights are really central to. Um, and, and, and these ideas, I think all three of them are ones that are well within the mainstream, often accepted by progressives in law. So it's really important to, to um, make them subject to question, because they have been seen, I think, as unquestionable in a sense. And, and one wrong idea is that, and it's really a central wrong idea that has gone beyond law and economics to be really the, literally the only way people can imagine talking about law in mainstream legal theory, I would say. And that's the idea that law has two functions, maximizing the pie, the economic pie, or dividing the pie. Here again is the storytelling, the metaphor. You know. Pie is not really fully explained usually, but it, it's somehow imagined as the aggregate monetized individual gain in some fashion or another, and they can spend a lot of time sort of tweaking out exactly different little technical versions of that. But whatever this pie is, it, it's taken as the proxy that really can't be questioned, that seems natural, for the overall, the value of overall economic growth or societal welfare. Now, in the old days, we might have just said, well, that's we're talking about the public interest, or what, what kind of economic you know, what's the nature of economic prosperity? What does that mean? And this translates it into something that seems innocuous. You know, I mean, who doesn't want to talk about economic growth? It, but the idea that it's an economic pie carries a lot more um, specific meaning. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm sorry. here's my notes on uh, what I was saying before. That law is Law is power, law and economics answers that by saying money is law. Money is not power, not legitimate power at any rate. Um, money is strong, law is weak. People obey money, not law. But um, so this wrong idea that there's uh, maximizing the pie or dividing the pie, um, it, it, um, 
it builds on the misconception that MMT challenges, which is that somehow the economic, the economy exists outside of law, that it's this thing, this reified, uh, fixed set of like natural resources that just sit there unmediated by human government or law, um, and, um, and that, that external thing somehow serves as a limit on law, constraint on law. Law can only govern it or you know, move it around, but law is not the generating force of it. Actually, let me say um, a little bit more on that. The, um, one of the, the problems of this is of this idea of, of separating law into these two functions, maximizing the economic pie that is assumed to be out there and a little bit indefined, undefined, and the, um, and the idea that, on the other hand, law can uh, redivide the pie, redistribute wealth. What that tends to do is, is um, bifurcate um, sort of the legal, uh, social justice from economic Concerns. And so you could be a, a bleeding heart liberal and support soft uh, social values, social justice, environment, wilderness, human life, um, you know, equality, things like that, um, under the name of redistrib redistribution. But that means you're turning away from maximizing the pie. In other words, you are sacrificing economic growth. And um, occasionally these two coincide, and you can do agonizing technical little tweaks to show maybe a few more times that they do coincide, and we can do both together. But the basic idea that this is what law does, it either um, helps this process of maximizing the pie or it redistributes the pie, I think, really rests on an, a, mis, a, a, a wrong assumption that the pie, the economic value, is something separate from, from law. Oh, okay, so another wrong idea um, is that people need money, not rights. So part of the, this is one of the major law and economics messages that's again taken as the ground of legal analysis today, that basically taxing and spending is the appropriate process if you're going to address inequality or any sort of problems of insecurity, instability, environmental harm, um, that that um, giving people money, not legal rights, has the advantage because it not only avoids distorting the maximizing the fly process, it just, it leaves that alone. Legal rights is, we want legal rights to mimic the market, to be the other epi phenomenon, so you can't distort the markets with legal rights, you have to turn to taxing and spending. We could give people money we, instead of, um, rights to particular economic goods instead of strong tort rights, instead of other kinds of, of legal rights to antitrust or any kind of uh, government regulatory pro program. Because money is better than rights because money allows people to be perfectly free, right? Those people who want rights, specific things, are paternalistic. They're not letting people make the individual choices. If you just give people money rather than rights, if you think people, the people who lose out, the losers in the current process need something more, um, give them compensation. But that, that ignores that money's value is not fixed. It's, it's, it's not commensable. It, it depends on the person's context and other legal rights. Rob mentioned that in an earlier panel. So if you say, OK, I mean, this is a standard line. Instead of the minimum wage, a right to a higher a living wage, basically, instead of that, we should uh, expand, further expand the earned income tax credit. That gives people money, a tax credit, blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious that what you get when, when you get um, a, an earned income tax credit benefit, you get, it, it comes out, what, once a year, and so it's a liquidity problem. I mean, meanwhile, most people who will be eligible for this are not going to have savings, so they have to pay rent, they have to buy food, they have to get transportation to get to work, they're going to have to go to payday lenders to borrow that money until the government gives them the tax credit, and they do so through, the, you know, a kind of cumbersome administrative system, increasingly stigmatized and, and um, scrutinized for fraud, et cetera, et cetera. Um, unemployment benefits, again, the, the idea that 
when you give people a benefit for being unemployed, you create a bad incentive, you give them more incentive to stay unemployed for longer, and that's a moral hazard problem, it, it's inefficient, and therefore it's counterproductive, you should just give people uh, you know, tax support for a savings account to tie them over, or whatever it is, um, and it's pure compensation. And so uh, I think the, the money analysis helps to support other empirical work, I think it's Rob, uh, uh, Raj Chetty that explained, gave it a, a, a ground level study of unemployment insurance and why people are, um, extend their unemployment period when they get unemployment insurance benefits and, and it's, it's, he analyzes the liquidity problem. It allowed, it gave them the liquidity to hold out for a job that they could really uh, keep and sustain um, and, you know, to extend the job search process and not have to settle for uh, temporary income, uh, and that's a normal process. So uh, just, and one more, uh, I'll just quickly say that the other wrong idea <laughs> is um, cost-benefit analysis is not rational. It assumes a fixed, reified view of money as a perfect, a perfect representation of value, um, and uh, by doing so, it destroys the economic value and freedom that really should be our robust view of what it means to have uh, power and freedom and democracy, which is the power to change the current market prices rather than to calculate them and add them up. <laughs> So I'm, I'm Robert Hockett. I'm a working on the presence in the sky uh, or over on a desktop. Uh, I'm very sorry not to be there uh, for a number of reasons. A lot of friends, of course, are there. Uh, there are also a lot of stars over there. I, I was hoping to make friends up. Uh, and to top it off, it was my hometown before I moved up here northeast about 17 years ago. So I, I very much wish I were there. Um, some pretty nasty sushi had a different idea as to where I should be today. So I'm, you know, I'm stuck uh, back at home. Uh, and in the event, just a few quick remarks uh, that I have to offer. Uh, a, a couple of sort of quick autobiographical remarks. Um, then what I hope will be a sort of substantive intellectual observation. Uh, and then a quick, uh, say, pedagogical observation that sort of flows uh, out of that. Um, autobiographically speaking, I think my background is actually quite remarkably similar to Raoul's. I sort of uh, found my way uh, into this school of thought uh, gradually. Uh, by various uh, stages, um, and uh, there's a surprising uh, overlap in the number of figures I found myself involved with um, on the one hand, and uh, those who Raoul found himself involved with on the other, uh, including my having uh, TF'd for uh, Roberto uh, Unger back when I was still a student, and having uh, worked with his, uh, his spouse, uh, Tammy, on financial questions for a long time. Uh, in fact, Roberto and I are actually bringing her final two books into uh, into publication right now, and the first one has uh, just come out. So it, it's I guess it's sort of a natural that that Raul and I might have ended up you know sort of in the same uh, camp. Um, Bill uh, Black and I have a bit of a history as, as well. Bill might remember that the very first uh, Jack Clark endowed lecture given over here at Cornell uh, was given by uh, Bill himself uh, at, at my invitation, and he. Of course, stirred up a hornet's nest here, and that was exactly what I was uh, hoping uh, for. And it uh, it went over quite well with the people it should go over well with, and uh, it uh, lit uh, matches under the toes of those whose toes uh, deserved a bit of uh, uh, singeing. Um, in any event, so um, now I find myself uh, teaching legal and financial subjects uh, over at the Cornell Law School. I've moonlighted at a couple of other uh, ventures over in New York City, uh, and in the past I worked over at the IMF uh, and at the New York Fed. So I'm kind of uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of up to the years, uh, always in, in finance and money uh, and, in, and in law. Uh, and bringing all those things together, again, feels rather natural to me. And I think it probably comes natural to all of, naturally to all of us uh, here at, at, at the conference uh, now. 
Um, when it comes to sort of um, you know uh, making any sort of intellectually substantive remark, um, I think maybe the, the best thing I can do, um, the best way I can sort of add a bit of value maybe is just to sort of make clear how I see MMT or the or, or, or fellow travelers uh, to uh, MMT scholars on the one hand and lawyers has been kind of a natural. It seems to be a, an altogether natural combination or altogether natural sort of melding of points of view. And, and, and the, maybe the best way to, to get that point across is by reference to a sort of just so story that I think is probably quite familiar to all of us and is probably all the more painfully uh, uh, familiar to those of us who have sort of had to work our way out of, uh, of that story. So the Just so, uh, so story you can think of, or I tend to think of it as the sort of the pre-political market story, right? So there's this kind of fantasy image uh, of a, an earlier time uh, in, in, in human development when we were all sort of walking around in animal skins, uh, apparently, and, uh, and hunting and killing things uh, and then gathering uh, other things, uh, occasionally making things, but for the most part just sort of, again, killing and, and gathering things. Um, at some point, uh, it emerged that some people had gathered more sticks, others had gathered more stones, others had hunted more elk, others had hunted more buffalo, and you know, it turned out that we would all be happier if we had sort of uh, mixed portfolios of these goods, and so we started bartering them with one another. So, and that's the sort of the, uh, the fundamental story, right? That's that's what gets everything sort of sort of going. Uh, at some point, people discover that it's a little bit inefficient or that there's a lot of trading that could get done that doesn't get done because we have the double coincidence of wants problem. I might have you know, a lot of buffalo, I want one of your elk, um, you only want one of my buffalo, but you need, uh, but, but you require two or three of my buffalo uh, before you'll part with your elk and it's kind of hard to figure out how to make these transactions work given that sort of lumpiness of the goods that we're bartering. Uh, and so lo and behold, somebody discovers cowrie shells or cigarette butts in a prison camp or some other uh, uh, object that can serve as a sort of, uh, as a sort of a lubricant for trade. Uh, we use this lubricant in order to uh, um, get past the so-called double coincidence of wants problem. Uh, we're now able to trade a great deal more. We've essentially solved uh, the world's first great transaction cost problem, as the uh, economists of law would put it. And that's essentially the role that, that money plays. Um, and you know now that we have, you know, hunting, gathering, uh, getting stuff, you know, uh, into portfolios, and then we have trading, we're bartering, and then we have money. We still don't have any law in the picture. Uh, law sort of comes in uh, sort of third and last of all. It's just a kind of an, uh, it's the sort of the second add-on, right? Money is the first add-on to that sort of primitive bartering relation. Law comes on as a sort of final add-on. It's a kind of an optimizer. It's just basically well, look, this whole trading thing is working a lot better now that we have this money thing, uh, both of which things are pre-legal and pre-political, but we still have this problem that sometimes people take stuff from other people without paying for it, or they bang people, or they bang one another on the head, uh, or what have you. We've got to impose some kind of order on the society in order for these economic arrangements to sort of work uh, optimally well. So we throw in a bit of law as well. It's the sort of final add-on. It's, it's the sort of spit and polish, you might say, uh, after we finally kind of cobbled the shoe together. Uh, and that's pretty much all the law is, and that's all the law is for, that's all it does. Um, in various organizations uh, whose existence at one time or another has been sort of predicated uh, on or has sort of taken for granted a view of this kind, you find that view of the law on the one hand and, and, and uh, the view of the sort of uh, coordinate view of economic relations on the other hand sort of reflected in the relative statuses of different uh, personnel within the organization. So for example, before uh, the 2008 crash uh, and ensuing crisis, uh, the IMF, as a lot of you know, was probably one of the uh, temples of so-called neoliberal uh, economic thinking. Uh, that was reflected in the fact that the people who had all the status there in, in, in my first stint there were the economists and the people in the various economics departments. And the lawyers uh, almost were like the runs of the litter or something. They walked around with sort of sheepish looks on their faces. They almost looked like they felt guilty about being there, uh, felt guilty that they were even necessary. Uh, and I actually kind of liked that in one sense because I thought, you know, I'm sort of tired of seeing lawyers being at the top of the heap everywhere. It was kind of fun to be part of an organization where humility came with your own uh, particular professional background and the lawyers were the humble people. Uh, that's actually not the way it is at the fund anymore. Things seem to have completely uh, flipped uh, since the crash, uh, as I can report after having worked there again uh, on my first sabbatical year a few years back. But, but in any event, leave the change to one side. 
um, and you see the essentially the, the sort of relative statuses of the economists and the lawyers at the fund, uh, I think nicely reflected in a way the view of the law uh, and the, the, the view of the role of lawyers that has been orthodox uh, among orthodox uh, economists. Now, that of course means that law is sort of marginalized. It also ironically means that money is marginalized. The marginalization of money, of course, is captured in the, the slogan that money is merely a veil. Uh, if money is merely a veil, uh, and if law uh, is the sort of is an add-on over the layer that is money, I'm not sure what that makes law. I suppose it's a sort of see-through gown or something, or maybe it's a, a pair of uh, skimpy, you know, overly short shorts or something. But it's a fairly demoralized view uh, of the law, as well as of money, of course. Um, and of course, the apotheosis, I think, of that form of marginalization, uh, maybe that form of humility, uh, as I called it a moment ago, among the lawyers themselves, or maybe that view, that, that form of self-hatred or self-loathing on the part of the lawyers, is of course uh, the, the the orthodox law and economics movement uh, of the kind that Martha mentioned uh, a moment ago, and that and that Raoul mentioned before as well. Because here we have a, a essentially a, an orthodoxy in the legal academy itself uh, that is telling lawyers that they essentially have a kind of epiphenomenal role. Uh, they're basically their job is essentially to kind of make rules. Uh, that sort of conform uh, to what optimal sets of arrangements uh, the uh, microeconomists have decided would indeed be uh, optimal. So we really are uh, sort of just you know mere technicians uh, in in Raoul sense, or if we're engineers uh, in the way that many lawyers like to think of themselves as being, we're engineers of somebody else's blueprint, right? Uh, and what's more, it might be Isaac Newton's blueprint because of course this orthodox uh, economic view. Uh, seems to uh, be enamored of the paradigms that are familiar to New New uh, I'm sorry, familiar to Newtonian uh, mechanics. It's basically sort of bad 18th century physics uh, transferred to the realm of, of humor, human uh, interaction. Now, against that backdrop, it's not difficult, I suppose, at all to see uh, why lawyers who are actually a little bit more thoughtful about what role law plays, on the one hand, and why economists who are a little bit more cognizant of the roles that money plays, on the other hand, might find common cause and might actually find themselves to be sort of natural, um, I shouldn't say bedfellows, that sounds maybe I've seen, but, but natural uh, sort of comrades uh, in, in, a, in a sort of a, a single uh, a movement. Um, and that's exactly what I think uh, is, is turning out to be the case. Um, uh, those who subscribe uh, to the MMT approach to uh, macro or to economic subjects more generally, and those who are sort of fellow travelers uh, to the MMT school, including many of the post Keynesian uh, school, uh, including some who maybe aren't fully MMTers but are sort of almost there or who think of themselves as maybe being cousins uh, to the MMTers. It's, it's kind of natural for them to make common cause with the lawyers because in a sense what they all have in common, I think, is they sort of turn the sort of three-part hierarchy that I just mentioned as being the sort of implicit uh, vision that seems to be at the core of orthodoxy precisely on its head, right? So instead of you know starting with huttering, uh, I'm sorry, hunting and gathering and bartering as the sort of the substrate of everything, uh, and then viewing money as a kind of the next layer that's layered over that to sort of uh, optimize things or to make things a little bit more, make things proceed a little bit more efficiently. And then seeing law as the sort of final eight, uh, icing on that particular cake by preventing people from stealing things from one another or banging each other on the heads or you know otherwise violating the, the rules of propriety and order on which uh, orderly economic relations would seem to depend, we start in a way uh, in the opposite direction, right? We actually view uh, economic phenomena as being largely driven by monetary phenomena or at least financial phenomena which themselves are driven by monetary phenomena. And then we view monetary phenomena themselves as legally constructed or legally uh, driven phenomena. So in a sense, we turn the pyramid on its head, the pyramid of the sort of classical view on its head, and we view the law as being, instead of epiphenomenal or as, as instead of being a sort of a later add-on, we view it as sort of constitutive of everything else. It's a sense, it's in a sense, it's, it's part of the very genetic structure of economic relations. It's internal to economic relations rather than being external and subsequently sort of added on or layered over. Uh, and then we view money and other financial uh, phenomena as flowing from these legal arrangements. Indeed, the monetary arrangements and financial arrangements just are legal arrangements. 
even the instruments themselves right, are legal instruments, as is evident by, if you do uh, pull, uh, Paul McCulley's favorite trick, pull out a dollar bill, read the front, read the back, what does it say? You'll find phrases like legal tender, phrases like federal reserve note, and, and so on. Uh, law is sort of there from the get-go. It actually constructs the instruments themselves, in addition, of course, to the rules pursuant to which those instruments are traded and pursuant to which the claims that those instruments represent are enforced or at least enforceable. Then, of course, uh, uh, those monetary and financial instruments and their flows and the kinds of claims that they represent or the kinds of claims that possession of them entails end up constructing or end up being fundamental to the remainder of economic phenomena. After all, you don't go out and trade, you don't sort of give somebody a laptop and then they, in, in return for which they give you a shoe or something, or you don't go out and trade or give a big you know, one big object for another big object. Essentially what you do is you trade claims on things, right? When you uh, take out a loan to buy a car, right? you issue a promissory note, you're issuing a claim on yourself into your future income stream. When you buy the car, you don't just walk off with the automobile, you walk off with the automobile and the title, and the title to the automobile is a legal instrument and that's the claim to the automobile and that's what makes it possible for you to prevent somebody else from taking it away or at least from uh, at least enables you to uh, get it back uh, using uh, having recourse uh, to the ordinary instruments of law enforcement in the courts and so forth when uh, and if somebody uh, uh, takes your automobile away from you so in a sense an economy really can be viewed as a sort of circulation a kind of never-ending circulation of legal claims the most important because the most widely usable of such claims are monetary claims and MMTers are quite cognizant of this they're on top of that they, they you know to use the, co the current idiom we got this right they got this um, and orthodoxy doesn't seem to have it so in, in that sense I think uh, again that there's a sort of a natural marriage or a natural sort of kinship uh, a kind of intellectual kinship a kind of uh, shared body of concerns uh, that we find uh, among lawyers who are sort of sensitive to the centrality of law to all economic phenomena on the one hand, uh, and then economists who are cognizant of and sensitive to the centrality of monetary relations and the centrality of the state to uh, uh, money generation uh, and money recognition uh, on the other hand, and that's just another way of saying that there's again a natural unity uh, among lawyers uh, and MMT-oriented economists. Indeed, it seems to me that, I mean, I, I have, I think, it seems to me I have more like-minded friends in the economics discipline now than I have in the legal academy. And that's precisely because there are more MMT-savvy economists in economics departments. Uh, a surprisingly disproportionate number of them, of course, right there at UMKC and another disproportionate number over at Bard. But there are more of those folk than there are uh, actual lawyers who are uh, cognizant of the centrality of money and the centrality of law itself. But of course, thanks to Rowan uh, and, and Roel and, uh, and some of their compatriots, that's quickly changing in the legal academy, especially uh, among uh, their, their cohort. Um, now, the last thing I'll say maybe is, um, again, I, I mentioned I'd say something sort of pedagogical. And the pedagogical observation I think I'll make is, it's just, it's actually kind of autobiographical too, and it flows right out of the sort of, I guess, intellectual observation that I've just made, that I, I, I take it as probably not particularly surprising to anybody in, in this room. Um, but it has to do with a course um, that, um, I've, that I introduced here at the law school last year. Uh, or maybe it'd be better to say that Paul McCulley and I both introduced it, because we sort of conceived the course several, maybe three or four years ago, uh, in his kitchen, or I should say one of his kitchens, a while back, and we thought this would be a cool course to teach. Uh, and then Paul joined us uh, as a senior fellow and adjunct professor starting last year, and he and I have been teaching it since then. So we, we've taught it one full semester, and we're now in the midst of our second full semester, our second year, basically, of teaching the course. But we call it Law, Money, and Financial Macrodynamics. And the basic idea behind the course uh, is reflected in the structure of the course. So the basic idea is that macroeconomic phenomena ultimately are driven by financial phenomena. That basically financial changes, things that happen in the financial sector or in the financial system, play a critical role, if not the most decisive role, in driving what happens in the macroeconomy as a whole. We then note, uh, well, the, sort of the next stage is to note that, well, monetary phenomena are really right there at the core of financial phenomena. Indeed, you know, it's, 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 to me it's still stunning how few people seem to know this. Of course, everybody in the room knows this, but 
It's stunning how few people know that the U.S. Treasuries market is by far the largest financial market in the world. And it's surprising how few people seem to realize that the dollar value of dollars in circulation out there is it just dwarfs right the value of any financial market for its part. So it's anybody who's kind of paying attention and anybody who's sort of looking at the numbers understands First of all, the U.S. Treasuries are really a kind of fundament to the, in, indeed to the entire global financial system, and they also understand that that other form of liability, that liability issued by the Federal Reserve rather than by the U.S. Treasury, is of course also right there at the rock bottom of the financial system, of the world financial system, and thus of the world economy as a whole. So we basically show first, uh, I mean, well, we don't actually show it in this order, but let's say I'm going to start conceptually speaking. And the conceptual order of, of the course is that macroeconomic phenomena are driven by financial phenomena, financial phenomena are driven by monetary phenomena, and then finally we root monetary phenomena in legal phenomena. Right, and this is kind of the Chris Dazan idea, but it's of course not just Chris's idea, but law itself, or the state itself, or both, right? Law as a kind of emanation of the state, or law as what the state does, or how the state acts. The state and the law through which it acts constitutes money, constitutes what counts as money, constitutes all of the other financial instruments, for that matter, that circulate in the financial system. And so in that sense, law is at the very bottom of it all. But we don't actually proceed in that order in the course. We try, we figure that pedagogically it's probably more helpful to start in the opposite direction, precisely because so many students would have been conditioned to think that things operate in the other direction, right? So we start with readings that emphasize the role of the law in constituting money, that sort of essentially on the legal nature of money itself. And then from there we turn to the legal construction or constitution of other broader financial phenomena, but also to the uh, readings that focus on the centrality of money uh, and monetary phenomena to broader financial phenomena. And then, of course, we move to the role of the financial system and the financial phenomena play in driving uh, fuller, uh, uh, more plenary uh, macroeconomic phenomena. And it seems to be making head, uh, the course seems to be accomplishing its purpose. I mean, the students sort of come out it seems with their eyes sort of open and they, they have the, the light bulb sort of go off, they recognize that there's been a kind of Copernican revolution, if that doesn't sound too pretentious, that's been worked in the sense that we've sort of reversed the, ordinal, the, the, uh, the ordinary order of things uh, when it comes to sort of what constitutes what uh, in their minds. And they seem like they're in a certain sense, I don't want to say converted because that makes it sound like they've been brought to a cult, but they've, they've sort of come to see the light, as it were. And I think the best reflection of that, maybe there are two reflections. One is they write absolutely magnificent research papers uh, for this particular course, at least half of which are publishable in law journals. Now, Raul and Rowan will tell you, well, publishable in a law journal is not really that much to boast about. There's a lot of rubbish published in law journals, but the fact is that this stuff gets published now, and most other legal uh, classes uh, or law school classes uh, that have paper writing requirements don't end up producing papers that get published even in law reviews. So it seems that the course stimulates the students enough to write interesting things and to research interesting topics that they end up writing publishable stuff. Uh, and then, of course, the second, I think, indicator of the fact that it's having an effect is they're all going out there now and talking to other people about what they've learned. And they seem to be getting into spirited arguments with their fellow students about uh, what we should think about orthodox law and economics and, and, and subjects of that sort. Um, so I guess I'll close there and just say that, you know, it, it seems to me that we've got something really important uh, brewing here. Uh, we should thank uh, the, the sort of founding uh, uh, personages of the MMT movement, I think, first of all, um, because even the institutionally minded lawyers and legal academics, I think, were not quite as savvy as they could have been about how critically central uh, the law is to economic phenomena, precisely because they hadn't paid as much attention to money as they might have done. So we, we owe a special debt, I think, to our, our, our cousins or our, our sisters and brothers in the MMT school. Um, and uh, But at the same time, I think uh, we have a lot further to go as well. There are a lot more lawyers to be converted, just as there are a lot more uh, economists to be converted. But if anybody can do it, I think it's a lot of us. Thanks. Thank you. I want to just uh, personal and institutionally uh, thank uh, all of the participants, all of whom have previously invited me to speak. Uh, and so we were uh, delighted with the uh, Modern uh, Money Network to um, work together to put this panel together and coming off the sickbed, 
uh, is uh, beyond the call of duty. Uh, I want to also just say one thing as the moderator, behind all of this discussion is ethics. Mm. And so let me give you three super quick vignettes. 1993, uh, George Aperloff, Paul Romer present their paper on looting about fraud in the savings and loan industry. The discussant is M. Gregory Mankiw. Mankiw says, on the record, it would be irrational not to loot if you were the CEO. That's 1993. 1996, George Mason, I'm interviewing with uh, their uh, group, uh, and they say, um, well, I, I was emphasizing that nine out of 10 savings and loan executives didn't, in fact, loot. And uh, the guy rolled his eyes and said, did you ever consider that the other 90% were just stupid? <laughs> and I said, yes, but since they survived and the ones you think smart all died, we rejected that hypothesis. <laughs> and the other one is 2009, an Olin Fellow, Law and Economics at Michigan, the institution that I got much of my training from, who I talked about how we could, knew this uh, crisis was coming, uh, and he said that can't be true, or you'd be wealthy now because you would have shorted. <laughs> so this guy, with my background, thought that I would see a disaster coming for the world, and that rather than warn about it, which is what I actually did, I would instead try to keep it secret so that I could become wealthy. Um, that is the underlying ethical problem that we all face. <laughs> Questions? Uh, I think Paul was first. Uh, is there a second mic or should I? I can talk later now. Yeah, but they need a mic so that they can pick it up. I think the, uh, so they. Well, first, there's something called the Annual Convention of the American Association of Law Schools. I don't know if you know. And I've been invited at least three times to talk to plenary sessions at this thing by a group of lawyers who are called so-so economists. So they, there is a group of lawyers who believe that economics and law, and they've done an awful lot of work uh, uh, in this area. And in fact, I would suggest they have a solution for the question of automation already. Uh, we know automation gets rid of workers' wages and how do you get the workers to get any income if they're being done by robots instead. The uh, social economic group has, I think, a reasonably good uh, solution. So that's the first one. Second point about legal tender. Uh, lawyers are involved in money because it's legal tender for all debts, public and private. Now, a debt, as I understand, I'm not a lawyer, requires evidence that there's a contract. You can't have a debt without a contract. So it's contracts, and now we talk about that in a little while. But the third one is even more, and this is part of this. Part of this. Uh, ever since Abraham Lincoln, lawyers have introduced regulations on labor markets to what I call create civil legal labor conditions in labor markets. Slavery is illegal. Uh, since the uh, 1920s, child labor is illegal. A 40 hour week is a requirement. Uh, safe uh, safe uh, environmental workers thing is a requirement. And if I'm not mistaken, somebody may, if American, uh, the Affordable Care Act requires uh, employers with X number of employees or more to provide health insurance, okay? And uh, just to give you an important, how, how important this is, uh, automobile, the big three automobile, the cost per worker of health insurance, including retired workers, of course, is equal to the cost of steel in each car. So that's a very expensive thing that we require. Now, law, again, regulation. If China or Foxconn was to, who makes these things in, in, in uh, China for Apple, uh, was to put a plant in California and operate it the way they operated in China, U.S. law would require us to. 
close the plant immediately and not permit any uh, of the product to be sold here in the United States, right? Are you right? Uh, but if it's produced in China, it's perfectly all right. Why? Let me make it one further. Suppose we had a factory in China that used slaves would and then wanted to trade the product in the United States. Would the lawyers say that's perfectly all right under the law of comparative advantage you can import labor, uh, slave labor products? What's the law? The lawyer's answer to that kind of question. We have specific conventions on slave labor, actually. But that is an example of the rule of law. Oh, well, I want to thank the panel for the wonderful conversation. Uh, I'm just concerned about reactionary forces using the law to preempt much of the ideas that we're discussing here. So, well, we could definitely agree that this network of evil of Google, Facebook, Apple, if you will, will definitely partner up with the Koch brothers. And they could potentially call for a like, constitutional amendment to forbid uh, deficit spending. How how we react to that as an MMT movement? What can we do about that? Which of you wants to? I'm sorry, is, is the question what we should do if Facebook, Google, oh, Google any actor want to do rent? So they want to pass a constitutional amendment uh, forbidden deficit spending. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we got to fight that. Um, I think that the political education project is important. The education project in and of itself is important. And by that, I mean formal education. And, um, you know, we have to hit it at every level. People have to understand what we're up against. I, there's no substitute for the work that I think MMT economists are doing about, you know, teaching people about sectoral balances analysis and like accounting identities, et cetera. I think as I highlighted this morning, we had our job and a job of lawyers is to tie that to people's particular experiences so that they understand that what's coming at them is not natural, it's not the way that things are supposed to be due to any, you know, pre-legal tendencies in the economy. This is something that is constructed to destroy them. So, yeah, we have to reach people on the ground, have them understand some of these basic ideas in a, in a, in a popular way, and, and also have popular alternatives. Like, I think that this sort of fear of, of, balance, of deficit spending and the idea of balanced budget, budget seems to be some, uh, an answer that people can understand with the household metaphor. They have to have a different answer to explain what the problems are that they're facing. But I think, but I think also I, I'm t trying to target the intelligentsia in a way that, that, that the fact that whenever this kind of political movement by those self-interested parties is, is, gets going, they trot out neutral academics to say how balanced this is, there's no other option, it's just rational. And I think we have to really make people, you know, hold people to account and, and really push them on and make it embarrassing to say things that they're just parroting, they're not, there's no, real analysis under that and to, to identify the source of their conventional wisdom that they're repeating to their own advantage as rational uh, science. Well, just to follow really quick, could they potentially call for a constitutional amendment to uh, prohibit deficit spending? Well, they're trying to move money through the state legislatures right now. Like this is, this is happening. Um, I think to answer your question in the context of this panel, to build a little bit on what Martha was saying, it's very important that we highlight that sound finance ideology is in many ways legally unsound. People assume that there are a lot of deep things in the Constitution or in statutes that require that the government use or spend or not spend money in certain ways. They assume rules exist that don't exist at all. And so we need to get those operations straight and how they connect to the law specifically. Because a lot of economists will you know, orthodox economists will pretend like there's something real, like there's something hard in the structure out there of, of the world that in the, they'll essentially punt to lawyers and never talk to the lawyers about it. And so we need to come in and say, actually, you think it's that way, and you are telling people that way. It is that way. But because, you know, lawyers haven't done necessarily a great job of disproving that, um, people are inclined to think it's that way, but we have to show that it's not. Questions?
Thanks, obviously I thought this was a great panel. Um, but I just wanted to uh, ask a question to all of you, which is, we we're talking about the role of lawyers and the role of law, but I just wanted to ask if you have any thoughts or can say some things about the role of legal thinking, because one thing that, from my perspective, when you think about lawyering, it's not always reading what's on the page the way that it's on the page. It's not always about sort of trying to get what the initial impression is rather than the secondary or reading between the secondary or tertiary implications of reading between the lines. And I think looking at a lot of economics, you see a kind of textbook that's like the Bible and it's telling you the things that are true. Whereas with law, you sort of read something and have to interpret and work out what the implications are and things. And there's a different style of thinking about how you approach a problem, how you approach rhetoric, how you approach pedagogy. I'm just curious how you see anyone those two different styles and sort of modes of looking at a problem and savviness coming. Good question. I don't really thought about it. It's, I think there's something really valuable about having to engage with real world disputes. You know, you're when you're reading legal opinions in, in the classic law school class or even just when you're confronting clients or, or particular legal problems that, you know, <coughs> I, I think you really get down into the, the dirty details, the empirical reality, how the, how the app, you know, how a particular person or, or where the bodies are buried and how it comes out. And I think that it, it's a, it, it's anecdotal in a sense, it's what you get one snapshot of one problem and one controversy, but understanding how that plays out really I, I think helps to cut through the fantasies and the, the things that get lost in the larger abstractions. Uh, so something that everybody in this panel shares, I think, is that uh, in law there is a group uh, in the academy that believes uh, you're sullied by actually getting out and doing anything with the law. Uh, none of us share that view and to turn Lucas's phrase on its head uh, about everything else is just pictures uh, until you actually turn it into a functioning law, rule, new institution, it sort of is pictures. So lawyers who are not just uh, thinking in theoretical terms but also in, in integrating it with the nitty gritty of how, how you create social change and then how you actually implement social change that is a useful perspective that economists that often don't share particularly well. And of course, uh, Lucas is also wrong about pictures because if he were in half the fields in physical science, he would realize pictures are the key to understanding science, but he's monodisciplinary, so. Uh, Time-wise, I think we have to wrap it up at this point. Thank you all again. So much.